Well, welcome to the month of August. Um, we made it to August. It's hard to believe we're like into the eighth month of this year already. I mean, and the year is just really flying by. I won't tell you how many days it is until Christmas, <laughs> but I'm sure somebody is like calculating that already now since we're, you know, past the halfway part of the year. But, uh, you know, for our purposes, we're in the final month of this quarter study of Proverbs. And then we'll be looking at the Song of Songs a little bit later. Um, of interest, we have five Sundays in this month, and so we're going to spend three of those finishing up our Proverbs study, and then the last two weeks we'll be looking at um, the Song of Songs. Well, today we're sort of moving on to new territory after what's been really a, um, a three-set cluster of lessons, and we examined um, first the importance of pursuing wisdom and then God's expectation that we would use that wisdom to live wisely after we obtained it, and then how using um, God's wisdom to live wisely would then um, lead us to a place where we're living um, in a way that's pleasing to, to the Lord. Um, well, in our lesson today, and it's titled Staying Sober, um, we're going to be looking at the 23rd chapter of Proverbs, and we're going to see how God expects us to be good stewards of the bodies that he's given us, especially when it comes to the matter of um, food and um, really more particularly and more focused on alcohol consumption. Um, but before we turn to read and study more about God's book of wisdom, let's turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we give you thanks for helping us get through a new week and watching over us in the midst of this COVID infection, which has forced us to dense distance ourselves from one another and to remain safe. Um, Lord, we pray for those who have been infected, and we ask for your hands to be on them and those who are caring for them. And uh, also for those who are working hard to develop a vaccine. For as always, Lord, we're placing our hope and our trust in you and in you alone for all things. And uh, many are on our prayer list, Lord, and they're either dealing with illness or recovery. Many are struggling with cancer issues, Lord, um, Peggy Stone and uh, Junior and George Deschel, Lord, um, uh, Bert um, and Vicki, Cheryl Whitmore and Doris uh, Capperletti, Lord, we pray that you would keep your hand upon them, Lord. We pray that the treatments would be effective. Ultimately, we pray for a place of remission, Lord, for all those who are afflicted with this disease. We pray for Roger Baldwin, who is in stage four renal failure, Lord. He's undergoing dialysis. We pray for um, a possible uh, transplant candidate to come forward, Lord, so he might be able to experience the same joy and blessing that Jan um, has been able to experience. Lord, many um, have injuries or recovering from surgeries. Um, I ask for prayers for Peggy Cummings and Debbie Cummings as they <clears throat> recover from their knee surgery and their hip fracture, respectively, be with Danielle Cummings as she is recovering from a serious car accident. Lord, we pray that she completely heals up with no complications, Lord. Uh, Lord, with this virus around, many people have compromised immune systems, Lord. We pray that you would place your covering over them as they're more vulnerable than others, Lord, to uh, be infected. We ask that you would be with those who are going through other hardships other than health, Lord. So many people are unemployed right now um, because of the virus and the impact that it's had on our businesses and our economy, Lord. This has caused a lot of financial struggles that people are going through, Lord, and these things also place strains on relationships. 
we just pray, Lord, for you to provide for those who are in need right now, Lord, to help them get through, make sure they can pay their bills, Lord, and have food on the table, Lord. We know that you are the great provider of all things, and Lord, we need you now more than ever. And Lord, we could never ask for a greater ally to be on our side than you are. And we just give you thanks and praise for all that you've been and all that you are and all that you're yet to be in our lives. So we turn to our lesson, Lord, we ask that you continue to teach us about wisdom, that you would continue to impart your wisdom upon us, Lord, that you would grant us good judgment and discernment, Lord. Uh, we need your guidance and direction. Um, we ask that you help us to enjoy the things that you've provided us, Lord, but to do so in moderation, especially when it comes to alcohol, Lord, which is gonna be at the center of our study today. We ask that you would speak to us fresh and new, Lord. You open our hearts and minds now to the hearing and the study of your word so that you might better equip us, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be and to do the work that you would call us to do. So we're excited about what you're about to do through these words, Lord, in your scriptures. And we give thanks that you're with us, Lord, and that you send your spirit upon us to help illuminate these words that we're about to study. We praise you, we uh, give thanks to you, and we pay you all the respect and honor as we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I've been fortunate, I guess, or I don't know to say fortunate, but I mean, I have just went through more than 60 years of my life and and I've never had alcohol in my whole life. So it's just one thing that I just have never had, alcohol and coffee. <laughs> and people are like, how did you go through the Navy for, you know, 20 and a half years and not ever have either of those two things? But it's true, you know, I just never got started, I guess. So I got to a point in my life where I just really didn't care to even start trying any of that stuff. <laughs> so, um, so I have never had any of those things, but, um, but I have experienced watching, you know, certainly, you know, what it does to, you know, other people. And um, so I was a drug and alcohol program advisor in the Navy and um, what we call a DAPA. So um, I, I was committed to working with people who maybe were struggling with alcohol issues, um, even though I wasn't, you know, one that would do it myself, but I just wanted to make a difference. And I think also show people that, you know, you could live a life without really having to do that if you didn't, if you wanted to. So, you know, through that experience, you know, working as a DAPA and with people um, who, you know, maybe had problems with alcohol, you know, I've seen people lose their jobs and I've seen people that damage their, their families, sometimes um, damage their marriages um, in, you know, ways that were unreparable. Um, as a result of misusing alcohol. Um, I had a person that I knew and still know and stay, still stay in contact with who decided to drive under the influence of alcohol and had an accident and killed somebody. Um, and it scarred him for his entire life. Um, it's something that he can never get away from. And he left a void in a family that, you know, is never going to be refilled again. Um, you know, to his credit, he goes around and he speaks to people about the dangers of drinking and driving. You know, it's what he's done. And it is, his form of redemption has been, has been that, to try to help others not make the same mistake that he did. By, and he shares his personal testimony, um, you know, as a part of that. And he is a Christian now. And so he has understood that, you know, that although, you know, he had this terrible experience in his life and he did something that, you know, that can't be removed. Um, he still understands that he's not condemned, you know, that uh, Romans A1 tells us that, um, you know, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I think that's a comfort for all of us to know um, because we've all done things in our life that we regret. 
and maybe we've done things that others might condemn us for. But the good news is, is that in Christ, um, there is no condemnation um, when we're in him. That um, through Christ, um, whenever this life is over and we stand before God to give account for what we've done, um, Christ has already paid the price. There isn't a sin that we've committed that he hasn't bore um, on the cross. And for him, that was a great comfort. Um, I've also known of a person who um, suffered um, complete liver damage as a result of many, many years of um, overconsumption of alcohol. So it has some really adverse um, effects that are connected with it. And um, I, I did a little research and, um, and I wanted to share this with you. This was um, um, a letter that was sent to Ann Landers by a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, they wrote this little piece in here and I wanted to share it with you. And this was based on their experience with um, uh, alcohol abuse and then um, moving into addiction. So they wrote, we drank for happiness and we became unhappy. We drank for joy and became miserable. We drank for sociability and became argumentative. We drank for sophistication and we became obnoxious. We drank for friendship and we made enemies. We drank for sleep and we awakened without rest. We drank for strength and we felt weak. We drank medicinally and we acquired health problems. We drank for relaxation and we got the shakes. We drank for bravery and instead we became afraid. We drank for confidence and we became doubtful. We drank to make conversation easier and instead we slurred our speech. We drank to feel heavenly and we ended up feeling like hell. We drank to forget and were forever haunted. And we drank for freedom and we became slaves to alcohol. And we drank to erase problems and saw them multiply. And finally, we drank to cope with life. And instead, we invited death. So <clears throat> I thought that was really telling um, as I read that. And Ann Landers would go on to write that people who drink to drown their sorrow should be told that sorrow knows how to swim. So I thought that was um, a very, very interesting quote. Now I want to also say that um, as we get into this, because a lot of people, you know, will say, well, you know, we're talking about alcohol and everything. Does the Bible say that it's wrong to drink? Well, no, um, the Bible doesn't say that at all. In fact, there are scripture verses that talk about alcohol um, in a very positive way. Um, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, um, verse 23, um, it says, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So, um, you know, it speaks to the fact that, you know, a little bit of alcohol can have some medicinal um, qualities to it. And I think there's been some further research about this that's shown that um, maybe there's some things that are in wine, let's say, that would um, help prevent, you know, certain diseases or help ward off certain sicknesses. So maybe there's something definitely to what the scriptures have to say here. And then, you know, there's a um, scripture verse in Ecclesiastes um, chapter 9, verse 7, that talks about how, you know, sort of drinking for celebration is acceptable. Um, it says, go then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart for God has already approved your works. We can go to the gospels and we go to um, Jesus making, um, you know, wine from water. You know, it was being used in a wedding celebration. And, you know, so even our savior, you know, he converted water to wine. You know, if the wine wasn't um, acceptable to um, be, you know, consumed in a celebratory situation that I'm sure our savior would not have been converting that water to wine. Um, so we see situations like that in the scriptures 
that you know seem to indicate to us that um, it, that it's okay. And it's like a lot of other things. Um, the Lord has blessed us with things, and you know, and and blessed us with things to enjoy. But you know, we can always overdo things, right? I think the key is sort of to do things in moderation. And so, sort of in the end translation, when it comes to alcohol, one has to just um, exercise extreme caution um, because the way that we consume it will impact and how much we consume will impact um, the way that it affects our bodies. And we know that alcohol does impair judgment. Um, we know that it does um, remove inhibitions. And the combination of these things really put a person at high risk um, and sometimes even in, in danger. Um, so we need to always keep in mind that exercising God's wisdom um, and doing it properly, it requires us to be clear-minded and focused on the Lord. Um, we have to keep our focus on him. We can't allow anything to distract us or um, to impact us in such a way that we might not allow him um, to lead and guide our ways. And thus, this is the importance of our lesson that's titled Staying Sober. Because, you know, when a person consumes alcohol, then their ability to make good decisions often changes. And too often, this can lead to them putting themselves and others in harmful situations. Um, and these are situations where a person's spiritually guided discernment becomes compromised and corrupted by the substance that they're taking in. And again, oftentimes this leads to regrettable, sinful behavior. Well, this is obviously not just a modern day problem. Maybe you're um, listening and watching this lesson today. Maybe you know of your own examples of people who either have or are um, abusing alcohol and the negative impacts that that's having um, on their lives and on the lives of others. But this isn't just something happening now in the 21st century. It was obviously a problem in Solomon's day um, as we are looking at Proverbs and um, old, the Old Testament times. Um, Solomon spends a lot of time here talking about the dangers of alcohol and overconsumption. Um, so we're going to get started and look at um, the 23rd chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs 23, and we're going to look at um, verses 19 through 21, and then we're going to move to 29 through 35. So if you have your student guides handy, um, great, break those out. Um, if you have your Bibles handy, again, Proverbs 23, and we'll look at verses 19 through 21, and then 29 through 35. So here's what Solomon writes, verse 19 through 21. He says, listen, my son, and be wise. Keep your mind on the right course. Don't associate with those who drink too much wine or with those who gorge themselves on meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will become poor, and grogginess will close them in rags. And then verses um, 29. Uh, through 35. He writes, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has conflicts? Who has complaints? Who has wounds for no reason? Who has red eyes? He says, those who linger over wine, those who go looking for mixed wine. Don't gaze at wine because it is red, because it gleams in the cup and it goes down smoothly. But in the end, it bites like a snake and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and you will say absurd things. You'll be like someone sleeping out at sea or lying down on the top of a ship's mast. They struck me, but I feel no pain. They beat me, but I didn't know it. When will I wake up? I'll look for another drink. Well, these are Solomon's words here um, in Proverbs 23, and in verses 19 through 21, Solomon urges his son, and remember that much of this book of Proverbs that we have looked at um, 
Solomon is written to his son. You know, the idea here is a father who, uh, remember, asked God for wisdom. God offered him anything that he wanted, and Solomon said, um, I'll take wisdom. Um, and God was like so impressed by that. You know, he could have asked for anything, but Solomon was young, and remember, he said that. Um, he wanted to have the right discernment and the right judgment to be able to lead God's people the right way. And so rather than ask for wealth or riches or anything else or power, he asked for wisdom. And in the end, you know, we know when we started looking at Solomon a long time ago that, you know, the Lord not only gave him what he asked for and gave him wisdom, but he turned around and gave him riches and wealth anyhow. Um, sort of as a reward for asking for something that was very pleasing um, in the Lord's sight. So Solomon was imparted with wisdom so much so, you know, that people um, came from all over to hear him speak. Other kings would send representatives to come to Solomon just so they could gain words of wisdom from him. Well, Solomon knew that, hey, you know, it was important maybe to impart that wisdom on other people outside of his family. But his main focus in Proverbs, as we've read, is really to make sure that he gives wisdom to his children and his parents. You know, this is something that um, we do all the time. You know, if you think that imparting wisdom on your kids stops whenever they become adults, um, I found that it multiplies. <laughs> OK, so, you know, um, your kids become older. You know, they need your wisdom more than they ever did because they're out here trying to make it go, you know, living this thing called life on their own. And um, they're walking paths that you've already walked. So oftentimes, I know my kids will check in with me just to ask for some guidance um, and direction, you know. And I just pray to the Lord that, you know, he helps give me the right things to say to them so that I'm imparting his wisdom to them, not my own. And this is really what Solomon um, was trying to do. Um, specifically, you know, he was telling his son, be careful who you hang out with, right? Be careful who your associates are. And specifically, he told him to avoid the drunkard and the glutton. I mean, why did he do that? Well, because each, um, whether the drunkard or the glutton, they didn't show good judgment. And they certainly didn't show any good sense of restraint when it came to um, consuming alcohol and food, respectively. I mean, there was no belief um, shown by them in moderation. I mean, the drunkard would always drink too much wine, and the glutton, would always gorge themselves and would overeat. And ultimately, both would lead to a life that would be lost in their overindulgement, um, a life that would make them impoverished. Um, and the scriptures say left in rags, which is just really sort of a referral to say that, you know, you're down and out. Um, well, conversely, a wise person, well, they would, they would not allow anything that would cloud their focus on the Lord. Um, they would stay focused on his will. They would keep their minds set on the right course and the righteous course. And of course, we know that the right and righteous path is the path that the Lord is always going to lead us on. We can't afford to allow anything or anyone to take us off that path. Um, we have to always stay focused on the Lord, keep our eye on the cross, keep our eyes fixed on him. Um, and not allow anything to take us off course, off the path that he wants us to walk on. Well, Solomon goes on to list all the, at least some of the adverse impacts of abusing alcohol, um, or even becoming addicted to it. Um, and many of these, you know, were in that AA letter to Ann Landers that I talked about. Um, Solomon, you know, he talks about woe and sorrow and conflict and complaining. Um, and senseless wounds um, or red eyes, you know, maybe could have included hangovers in there too, but maybe they didn't have a word for hangover, you know, back in biblical days. Um, you know, um, there's little doubt that over drinking, you know, listen, it brings a lot of physical and emotional problems. And yet what happens? People still do it. In fact, people still do it knowing what it's going to cause. Um, many people struggle with depression, okay? And what do they do? They will turn to alcohol as a way to cope with their condition. 
then what is alcohol? I mean, really, when you look at the substance itself, alcohol is a depressant. So you have a person who is depressed already and they drink and they drink a substance that is a depressant. So they're really just amplifying the problem that they already had. And ask yourself about whether or not a person is exercising sound wisdom when they do those kind of things. Um, the Lord would give you discernment, but we see that when people don't um, exercise um, moderation and they overindulge, um, these are some of the things that happen to them. But why do they keep doing it then? Well, because there is a temptation with alcohol. And um, note here how Solomon addresses how alluring alcohol is. And he uses <clears throat> some very vivid imagery when he comes to talk about wine in particular. He says, you know, it's a gleaming red color. This is the, you know, red wine. And it looks very nice and it catches the eye and it, it goes smoothly into the cup and it it's so silky smooth as it enters your mouth and goes down a person's throat. But Solomon wants his readers to know not to let all this fool you, okay? For when that attractive, smooth red wine hits bottom and gets into your system, it's far from pleasant. And I think it's interesting how Solomon compares it to um, uh, the bite of a snake or a viper's sting. I mean, think about a snake bite for a minute, right? That venom is very toxic and it causes adverse symptoms in the person who's been bitten. And Solomon's point here is that too much alcohol consumption can do the same thing to the drinker. He goes on to talk about some of the symptomatics of that. You know, the eyes, they start to see strange things. The mouth starts to speak absurdities. Maybe you've been around some people who've been drunk before. I know I have. I've often said the only person that can understand a drunk person is another drunk person, okay? <laughs> because if you're sober and you're around somebody who's been drinking too much, um, I can't relate to that. You know, um, and I have found that happen to me. Maybe you can say the same. Um, you know, and, you know, so often a person who's had too much to drink, you know, they, they injure themselves, right? In other words, they can't walk properly. You know, how many people that have been drunk have stumbled and fallen and severely injured themselves, maybe breaking um, limbs, um, injuring their head? Um, there's been any number of things that I've seen. Um, people, um, you know, do to themselves under the influence, certainly after all those years in the Navy, lots of foreign ports, lots of Liberty calls, lots of guys coming back very late um, and early morning hours. And some of them um, came back with some injuries that happened whenever they had fallen somewhere. Um, what's interesting is that oftentimes they don't even feel that they hurt themselves. <laughs> hey, you're bleeding. Oh, really? What did I do? I don't remember. You know, I don't know what happened to myself. And um, and I think these are, you know, if anything, you know, one of the um, major pitfalls of overindulging in alcohol um, that I've seen anyhow, and that Solomon doesn't talk about, is this matter of um, blacking out. Okay. Maybe you've heard of that, right? People drink to where they black out or they don't remember. And that's really scary when you think about it. Think about not being able to account for a period of your life, not knowing what you did, what you said, what happened to you during that time. This is the kind of detachment from living um, that overindulging in alcohol, particularly here, can, can bring to a person. And when you talk about losing your focus on the Lord, and being detached from him, being led on a path away from him. Think about being at a point where you can't even remember the things that you said or you did while you were under the influence. It underscores the danger of it and how we need to be really, really careful and cautious when we're using it. Now, you would think that all of these things would cause a person to re-examine their drinking and maybe opt for change. But unfortunately, um, alcohol, 
can gain such a foothold in a person's life that they're only focused on drinking again and again and again. And maybe you've seen this happen. I know I have. People that have crossed over from alcohol abuse to addiction, and there is a very thin line between those two things. When a person crosses over into addiction, alcohol takes on the main significance in that person's life. It is more important to the alcoholic than their family, their jobs, anything else. Alcohol becomes the main focus. Even the Lord becomes less of a focus than alcohol in the life of an alcoholic. And that's how dangerous alcohol consumption can be if it's unchecked. And why, you know, this lesson is so important um, to us today. Um, this lesson that reminds us to stay sober, this lesson that reminds us that our bodies are gifts from the Lord. The Lord did not give you a spare body, okay? None of us. I've never saw anybody with a spare body hanging up in their closet, okay? Um, so you better take care of the one that you have because you only got one, okay? And what you put into your body um, can, you know, do great damage if we're not careful. Um, and so Solomon here is trying to give his son and us words of wisdom and words of caution when it comes to alcohol. As we looked at earlier, there are scripture passages that talk about alcohol in positive ways. And certainly not everything about alcohol is negative, but it's like everything else. When we take something that the Lord has blessed us with um, uh, to use in proper ways and we abuse it and we misuse it, then bad things can happen. And uh, alcohol usage is no different. Well, let's look at our final two verses today. And for those of you with our student guide, you're gonna, you probably said early on, well, Mark skipped the early verses. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm going back to those early verses now because I really wanted to dive into, um, you know, I thought what I thought was the real main scope of this lesson titled Staying Sober. And that was jumping right into the matter of um, alcohol and making sure that we don't abuse it. Um, but we're going to look at these um, first two verses in this passage. And uh, this is Proverbs 23, verses 17 and 18. Proverbs 23, verses 17 and 18. So Solomon writes, don't let your heart envy sinners. Instead, always fear the Lord, for then you will have a future and your hope will not be dashed. Well, here we find primary guidance to follow in regard to living in righteousness and in a way that is pleasing in God's sight. And, you know, we spent a whole lesson last week looking at that, how we can live in a way that pleases the Lord. And remember, it was a, it was a transition from pursuing wisdom and finding it and then living wisely um, after we find it. And then, of course, by living wisely, that would proceed to put us in a place where we were living um, in a way that pleased the Lord. Um, and so Solomon here goes on to talk to his son about this matter of living in righteousness. And the first thing he gets at is that a wise person, they opt for the Lord and they do so always. And they do it out of a, a spirit of reverence and respect. Um, you know, they don't let anyone or anything else take precedence over the Lord, and that includes alcohol. Um, we remember that um, in Proverbs chapter one, uh, one of the very first key verses that we read in this book um, was um, Proverbs 1 7 that said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And, you know, we covered then that, you know, this fear of the Lord is not talking about a paralyzing fear. This is not a fear that, um, that leaves us um, in a place where we're so afraid that we can't function, but rather it's a very strong and rich reverence and respect for the Lord. And we get there by understanding who he is and who we are in relation to him. He is all powerful and we are powerless, okay? He is perfectly righteous. We are sinful. And so when we stand before him, we're completely subordinate 
to him in every way. And that is a place that should always bring us to this idea of complete respect and reverence for the Lord. And when we understand that we can't do anything without him, that we need him for every single thing in life to include the wisdom that we need to live, then and only then, you know, do we have a hope of really gaining knowledge, true knowledge. And that's true knowledge that comes through our connection with him and our respect and our reverence for him. Um, so anybody who does this, who completely places their full respect and reverence on the Lord, well, you know, those people are not going to ever let their hearts envy sinners because they understand the foolishness that can be found in a sinner. And I think we've seen this comparison and contrast through Proverbs. You have these two schools. You have people who choose to follow the Lord, to give him their fullest respect and reverence. And when they do, okay, whenever they understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, whenever they understand that um, we're not to lean on our own understanding, but we're to um, place all our trust in knowing the Lord so that he will make our path straight and will lead us away from evil, then we know that we can be on the right and righteous path, but it's because we're placing our focus on the Lord. On the other hand, we have people who reject the Lord. And all the way that we have seen through Proverbs, when you read people about people that reject the Lord, okay, who do all the things that the opposite of what Solomon is talking about, they lean on their own understanding, they don't have any kind of respect or reverence for the Lord. When you see referrals to them in Proverbs, almost every time they're referred to as fools. There's this matter of foolishness, and think about it. Um, it's true, right? Any person who would decide to turn their back on an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present Lord is nothing less than foolish, <laughs> okay? Because who would do that? I mean, anybody in their right mind would never do it. So Solomon is encouraging his son, listen, don't get in company with those people. And listen, don't ever envy the lives that they're living. Because sometimes Christians might look and say, well, gosh, there's all these restrictions on me to live as a Christian. You know, I got to live as Jesus lived. And boy, that, that just really cuts down on the things that I can do in my life. And they're looking at other people, those foolish people, right, that are living, not living for the Lord. And they're out there doing whatever they're doing. You know, they can do whatever they want. And it seems like, wow, they're just really having a great time out there. And what they, you know, what you don't see is how much, you know, they are walking um, as condemned people, as foolish people, as people separate from the Lord, as people who are absent with Christ. They think they're walking on this great path of life. And really, the bottom line is they're walking on the road and on the wide path to destruction. And remember that, you know, everybody's going to live forever, okay? So you're either going to live with the Lord forever and experience that promise of eternal life that we have through Christ Jesus, or you can reject Christ in your life, and you're going to be living in eternal damnation and torment and suffering for your whole life. So take your pick. Only a fool would opt for the latter, okay? Only a fool would choose to live in eternal torment um, and damnation. Well, um, anybody who is wise and who stays wise in the Lord. They know the destiny of sinners that I talked about, and they also understand that they have an eternal, eternal glorious future through Christ Jesus that you would never want to trade in for anything. I mean, he's given us a hope for a future, a guaranteed hope. You know, the word of the Lord in Romans tells us that, you know, um, and in Romans 8, that um, when we receive Christ, we become God's children, and we become God's children, we become heirs, and not just heirs, but we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus himself. In other words, that whenever we accept Christ as our Savior, we are given part and parcel of the very kingdom of God, and that's what awaits all of us. If you think this life is great right now, wait, okay, because anything that you've went through in this life that's been really good, it's going to pale in comparison to heaven when we get there. The glory of the Lord is going to be like nothing else that we have ever experienced. And the best day yet for us has still not yet come. But we know it's coming. And that's the good news that gives us hope to live by each and every day. Um, so the key here is for all of God's people 
to remain sober, to be of clear and sound mind, so that our decisions can be led by the one who perfectly leads us um, to make those decisions in the way that he wants them to be made. Decisions and judgments that are dictated by the Lord, not by some mind altering substance, not by any other person in this world. Um, it's the only way that we can ensure that we're making the right choices and that we're exercising good judgment because the Lord will always guide us to both. Well, we have two weeks left in this study of Proverbs. It's been really rich. Um, and next week, we're going to be looking at um, the matter of the Lord's discipline. And this is a subject that maybe we don't talk about enough. Maybe we should talk about it more. But I think um, going back to what I talked about in becoming God's children, um, when we're his children, then he is our father. And we have a perfect heavenly father. And if anybody's parented, you love your children, you care for your children. And sometimes that love and care for your children involves discipline. And we don't correct our children because we love them less, but we correct them because we love them all the more. And I know Grace and I, we used to um, use the scriptures. When we had to correct our daughters, they would tell you. <laughs> they would come in and we would sit down with them and we would read the scriptures. And we would choose the scriptures that would highlight um, why the mistake that they made, you know, was not acceptable to the Lord. It's not that it wasn't acceptable to us, but we really wanted them to know that, you know, you're accountable to the Lord. Um, and first and foremost, accountable to him. So there's this matter of discipline, and it's really, really important in our lives, and we need the Lord's discipline to ensure that we're walking the right path. And we're going to take a look at that next week as we move on to look at Proverbs 29. And um, of interest, as I've mentioned in the past, um, we're going to see that, you know, in Proverbs 29, these are some of the additional Proverbs that were that were mined up um, by King Hezekiah, and they were added to this book of Proverbs. Um, but there had been a, a bunch of Proverbs that Solomon had written and actually had become lost for some time, and that were found later and then were added. And then we have a couple chapters of Proverbs um, that um, are not written by Solomon. And we'll be taking a look at some of that, the last um, couple lessons of um, this particular quarter. Um, so thanks for joining me today. Um, blessings to all of you. And um, I hope that your week ahead um, will be full of the Lord's joy, full of the Lord's blessings, and definitely full of his protection. So God bless you until I see you next week.